very nice to be a part of this forum. And, uh, and I'm going to speak about something that I think has uh, broad interest within the uh, NMR spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy community. And, but it's going to be from a probably a vantage point that is maybe not familiar to all of you. Uh, in the NMR spectroscopy world, we are typically focused on the quantum mechanical interactions that are responsible for the type of behaviors we observe in the spectra that we acquire. Uh, they always tend to be nuclear spin interactions with their environment. They tend to be very local range. That's the power, one of the powerful things about NMR. It's a very powerful diagnostic of a local, local nuclear spin environment. And I'm going to be speaking about things that are further away than that local environment. They're going to be distances that are na many nanometers, maybe even a micron farther from, from that nuclear spin, uh, where the polarization uh, needs to be delivered. And how that delivery of polarization occurs is a subject of great difficulty to interrogate. Uh, that's because those distances that I just mentioned are far from these quantum mechanical uh, interactions that, that, uh, that we typically focus on. And so there are very many aspects to that that make this a particularly challenging length scale from which to sort of it probe. And so I come from a chemical engineering background, and usually I'm bringing NMR and the quantum mechanics into chemical engineering applications. And in this particular case, and it's one I feel has great intellectual richness, uh, I'm taking chemical engineering principles into the, into the other direction. And, and that's what I want to share with you about. So it's been principally the, the, the PhD work of an outstanding graduate student in, in my group, uh, Nathan Prisco. So I want to give him a tremendous credit for this. We had, I had some ideas about this during the start of his PhD, and he really ran with it in a way which I think has turned out more, much more broadly and much more um, generally than I initially thought would be the case. And it turned out to be a richer sort of field to play in. It also was involved important discussions and collaborations with, with Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Emsley and, his, and Arthur Pinnell. Um, now at the EPFL, and Arthur is, uh, is now in the Swedish NMR facility in Gothenburg, Sweden. So the, kind, the system I'm going to be talking about is one where we have these paramagnetic biradicals, okay? Uh, and we have these radicals, and we have to get polarization from them, which we excite with our microwave, as many of you are familiar, uh, to from that biradical, which has these high degree of electron spin polarization, uh, into the nuclei uh, that will take it to the location where we can beneficially use it. Now, in uh, this involved, I'm going to be speaking principally about uh, cross-effect DNP, but I would um, assert that the kind of aspects that I'm going to be talking about are general, are general for hyperpolarization from any source, and I think that what's satisfying about this from a chemical engineering point of view is the applied mathematics are easy to understand. Once you, the physical processes are, are really have analogies to things that are in thermodynamics, but it leads to analytical solutions of how that polarization transfer occurs and what the rate limiting steps are so that we can, we can basically use the insights we're gonna get to basically design an experiment for a given formulation and a given material. So I wanna, that's what I wanna talk about. And so we were motivated by this, uh, uh, has the benefit of the nice profound uh, understanding, but we were motivated by us to look at certain types of problems, which were in like cement chemistry, were, supported by the US Department of Transportation, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, they build things if they're interested in cements and, and polymer science. Okay, so in case there's anyone who's uh, not directly familiar with the concept of hyperpolarization, I'll have this one intro, intro slide just to give a sense of what this means and for maybe some of the more um, uh, unfamiliar uh, view in the audience. And so what we, we have is in this case, let's say a cement particle. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about cements, but it's relevant and I can, and we're working on this problem now, but it's a anhydrous particle with no protons in the center, but it's got a very thin outer hydration layer, which does have protons. And that could have, and it could have, and, and it could have, but there, there's adsorbed organics on it, could have carbon 13, but these or, adsorbed organic molecules on a, on a surface, or otherwise, are ones which we have interest in polarizing with, uh, but be, are 
often suffer from the fact that the surface area of these systems is very, very low. Uh, often these particles are maybe mi many microns, and so the surface areas of these 10 to 20 micron sized particles in a, in a typical cement particle is going to be approximately a meter squared per gram. That is not enough surface spins from which then to uh, achieve a reasonable signal noise from which to do most of the measurements that we like to exploit for NMR. So we'd like to enhance the, the signal intensity from that. And, and the way it's been done, and we're standing on the shoulders of, of, giant, of, of, of Bob Griffin's work and Alexander Barnes and others in Bob Griffin's group, who for many, over many years developed this, this uh, aspect of dynamic nuclear polarization. And we're, in, in this case, you use a bi-radical, and that's, there's a lot of talk uh, discussion in the literature about the, why this architecture works. But basically, they have these two uh, unpaired electron spin moieties which uh, can be excited by high-powered microwaves at a frequency that generates a large polarization. And that, and that because the electron has a mass that's about 1,000 times less than that of, or 660 times less than that of a, a nucleon, you get a big polarization um, enhancement here that when transferred to the protons in the surrounding sort of medium uh, by hyperfine interactions can result in that a ratio of that uh, gyromagnetic ratio, it's intrinsic property of the of the um, of the um, nucleon or electron spin to get a large enhancement of polarization in principle. But that's a theoretical limit, and it's gonna and that's one that's rarely reached. And it's and I'm gonna we're gonna talk about that. And the reason why it's rarely used is because there's actually it's not a completely efficient transfer across this as these yellow arrows show. And in fact, that's this what's known as the spin diffusion barrier, and that will fact fact feature in as to why we're trying to do the uh, what limits our ability to get things that are higher, uh, this high. Now, from that point on, this is now, this the, the nuclei are far, relatively in the frozen solvent, can be far from this, bio, this uh, paramagnetic centers. And therefore, the way subsequent frozen molecules in the uh, nuclei in the frozen solvent receive polarization is by dipole-dipole couplings between proton spins. And those proton spins can then take the mag magnetization and spin diffuse I actually, I think that's a bit of a misnomer because I'm a chemical engineer. Spin diffusion means molecular transport. And this is more of a, I would call it like a spin conduction. It's more of an energy transport as we, it would be a, probably a more proper way to refer to it. And that basically energy conducts. And so what we set up here is a polarization gradient, a big, big source at the electron and it then diffuses or conducts from that source across some barrier down to, in, in as far as the magnetization will persist as long as relaxation basically persist. And see, these are done now in solids. So I'm speaking about solid DNP um, at temperatures, in this case, around 100 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, we have these large sensitivity enhancements because of these big, big polarization gains from the non-Boltzmann um, uh, polarization, much shorter measurement times, and selective detection of the surface species because we polarize selectively from this surface here. And again, we're you know this was all with analyst Ajahn and Lyndon Emsley, and we have a 400 megahertz where we've done these experiments at UCSB. Here are the main points that I'm going to lead you to. So if you can consider these essentially general conclusions, which I'll then discuss and support. So, and the reference to the paper that I'm going to be taking most of the work here from is, as I listed here from a couple of years ago. So basically is that this hyperpolarization, generated however you want, uh, could be optical, I think is, is fair to say, is transferred, can be transferred over macroscopic distances. And when I say macroscopic, I mean as long as your T1 times will allow you to. So these macroscopic distances for our purposes is going to be nanometers, hundreds of na 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers. But in case the relaxation times are very long, it could be much longer than that. And they, but they, that macroscopic distance means that the quantum mechanics now is um, something that needs to be, can be at this interface with classical uh, thermodynamic and constitutive relations, which can therefore are valid in these mac for these macroscopic sort of distances over which the hyperpolarization is, is being transferred. And therefore, what I'm going to show is that beyond this very short range spin diffusion barrier, that we can use scaling analysis to and en that enable the propagation, that is how far this nuclear spin polarization can be can be transferred and to do it quantitatively. Um, and from that, we can get very detailed insights on what the rate limiting processes for that transfer process actually are. And furthermore, for the case of materials, that's very it's helpful because we can use this now for predictive design criteria 
to establish the optimum conditions for polarization transfer for a given set of conditions and materials. And I'll say more, you'll see how this comes along the way. Because what's different about material science applications of DNP are that if we're talking about a cement particle, or if we're talking about a, a polymer, as I show here, uh, the, the example I will be speaking about is this is a dissimilar interface is a, 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 a on the left you have a, a biradical collection of biradical and a frozen solvent against a polystyrene sphere. And so the polystyrene sphere is highly protonated. These are partially deuterated for reasons that you will become clear. And then we have this uh, the, the generation of the electron spins and you can get polarization transferred uh, into the medium, into the solid, by the spins, from spin diffusion, and all of that is tremendously complicated. And so what we're going to show is that we can, by understanding this, we can get, we're going to be able to show that there are certain regimes which we can say are spin diffusion limited and others which are spin exchange limited, and they depend on a number of variables that we can identify and, and, and analytically sort of predict without recourse to any sort of assumptions or um, or or um, without having all parameters specified. So here's the polarization transfer regimes that some, that many of you may have thought about already. Uh, we have these localized electron-electron interactions between the spins and the biradical. They are coupled often to each other uh, in the case of the, the, uh, the, the cross effect, but they're also coupled to the large nuclear spin bath. And that's the, the frozen solvent around it. it could be tetrachloroethane, uh, dichlorobenzene, others that have been shown. And they tend to be, and or maybe, or in the case of DNP juice, uh, glycerol water, depending on what sample you are. And in that case, for the bio, biochemical type systems, they're basically all the same because a protein and these biomolecules all have the same. And so the optimization of those type of, of systems has been basically already done. But for the kind of material science that we do and many others are interested in, it's actually, there's a vast range of surface areas, material properties, proton densities, and it's it's a um, it, there's just many many more variables and the recourse is to have to in an ad hoc Edisonian way you know it just work your way iteratively through to find the best conditions and level of deuteration and bi radical concentration and this uh, what I'm about to say I think this will help will helps basically give you a lot more of a directed design benefit to sort of identify what the conditions are so that you don't have to iterate quite to the extent to get the same sort of optimum signal that you might otherwise. So we're going to, so here are the kind of regimes, this, we would call, we'll call this the hard wall, which is that within this region of the biradical, there are protons around there, but spin diffusion is largely suppressed within about a half a nanometer of the paramagnetic center. That is, it's, it's basically quenched. And then you have this barrier region, which is this purple, and this barrier region is this spin diffusion barrier and that is a barrier where you have large, as I show here, inhomogeneous magnetic fields that, that uh, from this, these cross-effect dipole coupled ele uh, electrons to uh, the hyperfine interactions out to the, this bath of this large ensemble. And that spin diffusion barrier is on the vicinity of one to two nanometers, okay? And that is, again, a subject of a great deal of research as well as the, the, the physics of the electron electron uh, couplings and then the couplings across that spin diffusion barrier. We're going to take these things as essentially given for a given set of properties, and we're focusing mostly on how the magnetization transfers from that barrier into the bulk ensemble, not knowing in detail what the physical processes are quantitatively very easily within this very complex physical region around that biradical center. So we're going to just but what we are going to, and this is a very familiar problem with chemical engineers, we have this barrier that's hard to know in the case of, I'm going to make some analogies in a moment to help sort of show how we approach it, such that we're going to be out in this dipole-dipole coupled region far from the, uh, far from the, the, uh, the, the biradical, and that's where the nuclear dipole-dipole interactions dominate uh, greater, I should say, greater than two nanometers. It's, it's heading to uh, 100 nanometers and more. So here's how a chemical engineer would think about it. And I teach classes in this um, at UCSB in uh, catalysis. So you have this mass balance of chemical reacting species. And in, the, and in this case, you have these in both the, a, a catalyst type process, which is a mass transfer. You have a, you have a coupled transport that is diffu and diffusion. 
and kinetic processes. That's a reaction. So if we have a bulk sort of concentration out here, it comes across a catalyst particle. This can be many millimeters. It's porous. And so the, the, from the bulk concentration, the, 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 the reactant will diffuse towards the particle. There's a, now it often is convectively mixed. So it's a fluid, very mixed with fluid, but near the surface, there's a no slip boundary condition. And the knowledge of this dotted line around it, of the character of the profile, concentration profile within this dotted barrier to the surface is very complicated and basically not easily understood by first principles or otherwise. What happens then, it gets inside and then it diffuses and reacts. And so you have this transient process. Uh, often you have a molecular diffusion term, which is diffusion coming in. That's just fixed, fixed law. And then you have a consumption term by chemical reaction or a generation term if it's a product that then diffuses out. And so you have this process which you have concentration, molecular diffusion, and reaction, which are sort of now uh, competing with each other. In the energy balance analogy, you have, uh, let's take a, a copper sphere. You have a bulk temperature. Uh, the, the, temp the, 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 uh, the um, temperature of the sphere may be different. And, and so if it's, if it's cooler and you're putting it in a hot uh, fluid, you have this uh, gradient from the bulk to the surface. Again, a dotted line where the complex uh, temperature profile within that line is, is very poorly understood. And then once you get to the surface, then the energy is conducted in, in the interior. And for that, you have, a, you, have uh, you have Fourier's law, you have the uh, temperature uh, as a function of time, uh, you have a thermal conductivity here, K, and you have a heat loss uh, or generation if in case you have a, uh, you know, kind of radiative heating or, or otherwise some electrical heating. So you have these transient terms, you have a thermal conduction or molecular diffusion, and you have a consumption and reaction term, which is, is all uh, these coupled transport and kinetic processes. And we have that similarly in the case of the DNP NMR process. So we can do a spin polarization balance in an exactly this analogous way. So we have an accumulation term, which is this time dependent term, but instead of temperature and concentration, we're going to consider polarization. That's good. We can measure that. That's what we measure in our NMR experiment. We have terms that are, that are going to look familiar, and I'll go, go back in a second. You have this density, you have a heat capacity, thermal conductivity, and a generation term. And for this, we have a proton density, a I call it C, a CZ, which is effectively a heat capacity, or we call it a spin capacity, that comes from just the nuclear properties of the gyromagnetic ratio, uh, the magnetic field strength, that allow us to calculate the equivalent of a heat capacity in, for in, in spin terms at a given field and temperature. We have a, a polarization generation by DNP because often in these cases, we're exciting it by, by uh, continuously with microwaves. And if it's continuous excitation, then this term is going to be finite. And then we have this polarization conduction term. This is, this is spin diffusion where we have the polarization, again, second derivative, proton density, that spin capacity, and then a proton spin diffusion term. So all, uh, and then in, in the dissipation is then going to be this spin lattice relaxation. So you have, which again has, has this form. So we have terms that look very familiar to, to from the point of view of the mass and energy transport that we're just doing with a basically polarization balance. And we're not the first to think of this. This is then thought of in a way, and, and it's, we're kind of by giants in the field. And so I, I have to acknowledge them, uh, Bloomberg and, Back in the and, and, and Pierre de Gen in the back in the 1950s, uh, we're looking at spin conduction from dilute paramagnetic sensors because, after all, that's what classical uh, you know people were doing classical models at the time. And um, and then uh, spin diffusion in homogeneous fields by Janak and Redfield, looking at how, what, how this how this happens across this. And they were also using these classical spin models. More recently, uh, there's been really a very related work by. Um, from, I mean, from Bob's group, Bob Griffin's group, um, uh, Bjorn uh, Corzelius, um, Adam Smith, Alexander Barnes, and, and so on, and Adam Smith, where they have looked at polarization transfer in solid effect DNP. All of this is consistent with what I'm going to show, but what we're, but compared to what the earlier work had done, I'll make a couple of distinguishing pieces that I think I've identified, is that most of this is in the case of the early work was that you had a paramagnetic impurity and it was a sink of polarization because you were polarizing a bulk 
And that bulk was being uh, going the other direction. It was going from the bulk to the paramagnetic center and being consumed. And hence, you had a rapid relaxation in the bulk. We're doing it the opposite. It, we're exciting the electron spin with the laser, uh, with the, uh, the microwaves, and it's going the other direction. And so we, ha uh, we have a, a polarization generation term that, that they don't have. And, and then in the case of the, um, uh, the, uh, the um, I guess that's what I basically want to say. And the other thing is that we're going to say is that uh, when you have, and this is a factor with respect to the, 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 uh, the analysis of heat and mass transport, is that when you have these diffusion terms and you have the, um, the, uh, the, these dissipation terms, the, the question that chemical engineers would face is that how do you know which one dominates? Is it the conduction term or the dissipation term? And going back for a second, is it the molecular diffusion term or the chemical reaction term? They have completely different units. So you can't just take the, the ratio of the diffusion coefficient to the reaction rate. Those units don't match, nor can you do the same with the thermal conductivity and these terms over here for the temperature gradient. What one does is one creates, therefore, and this is where I think our part is very helpful to the other, what the others do, is we're going to form and do a dimensional, dimensional analysis such that we're going to have dimensionless constants and parameters that will allow a proper comparison of the re relative importance of these two terms, and those relate to the experiments that we want to do. And I noticed there was a question, so I'll, I can pause for a moment if, um, if you would like to ask that. Sorry, I didn't see a question. Oh, I saw um, there was a raised hand, I thought, uh, came up on my screen. OK, uh, whoever raised their hand, if uh, you want to ask that question in the Q&A, um, we can come back to it in a minute. But for the meantime, uh, go ahead. Please. OK, OK, so so here's the thing. So with what we do can acknowledge is that we have these different terms that we see in this e expression. Polarization is what we're going to measure. Time, of course, is what we're going to be paying attention to. But then we have the material properties how many protons are in our, our ensemble. And that's one, as you know, from uh, experience that we use these DNP juice, which has got some partial deuteration. And that, that affects the, the density of protons in the matrix. CZ, that's the spin capacity I mentioned, will be different for different nuclei, different for different spins, different for different magnetic fields and temperatures. But those are basically material properties. The, um, the other thing we have is the spin uh, diffusion coefficient. And that is one which um, of which there, there are opportunities for, for more measurements to be done. And in the case of, uh, of polystyrene, uh, one can estimate it in a rigid limit for some, in a, something that's far below its glass transition. By One can get an approximation for the spin diffusion coefficient, and we've used that. That's work that Lyndon uh, and uh, Arthur have done, where you can get an estimate for the diffusion coefficient from that's, that's quite, quite reasonable. In the case of some of the cement particles, and at least for because this is for polymers uh, that has been applied, and Klaus Schmidt Rohr has done some nice work on measuring with a whole burning experiment for these types of materials. We adopted that to actually measure spin diffusion coefficients, for example, for hydrogen in a surface hydration layer of a cement particle for silicates or aluminates. So in many cases, you need to know this spin diffusion constant uh, spin uh, diffusivity in order to basically make it parameter, uh, I say adjustable parameter free. The other thing is that we have this experimentally imposed, you know, generation term, which is the basically the source that we're applying with our continuous microwave spins. So now with that, we can now say, well, okay, this looks like a partial differential equation, second order and uh, second order partial differential equation, and we can now have boundary conditions. So we need two spatial boundary conditions. And the, the first one in the frozen solvent, we can say at boundary condition, the first one, far, very far from a paramagnetic center, way out in, far from it, basically it flattens out. And the derivative of that polarization is as you get further and further out, approaches, approaches asymptotically zero far from the, a, a paramagnetic center. So that's that's a symmetry boundary condition far from the paramagnetic center. We also have this boundary at this spin diffusion barrier. And now that's really where the problem is or the, the challenge is. What's the, how do you measure that? And the answer really is um, not easy. And so that's this polarization at the, at the, where the thermal boundary begins. And so how chemical engineers, that's the same thing in the heat and mass transfer problem. We don't know what the concentrations is right very near this, this film resistance to, 
master energy transport, this is like a film resistance to polarization transport. And this is this so-called spin diffusion barrier. And for that, what we do is we set it up as we just acknowledge that there's going to be this generation term from this cross effect polarization that that you know with all the quenching of this of the spin diffusion it's going to be it may start out at 660 here 658 here but by by the time it gets across this barrier it's less now that is something where there's a opportunities to make a, you know advancements in trying to get this pce and as uh, as high as possible and also such that you can minimize and reduce the barrier that's presented here. But we're just going to take that as kind of given, and we're going to say, well, how do we get? How do we understand that? Well, what we can say is the flux that gets across, whatever it is, is going to depend. Is at, at this at this barrier right here is going to be equal to the the gradient across this. That is going to be PCE divided by or minus this. Uh, the, this is a linear gradient, and that's what this delta delta P is. And it's going to depend on these terms. And I'm going to, and this then, this KDNP is something that Bjorn uh, Krasilius has, has worked with in a similar way. This is a polarization transfer coefficient. And it just is a, is a parameter that reflects the, the, the speed and, and the efficacy of which this barrier basically allows polarization to be transferred. So, so we know rho H, we know CZ, we don't know this polarization transfer coefficient. And that is the part that we're going to be focused on. So what we are going to say is from the literature, uh, it's been, you know, we're going to take, it's going to be one to two nanometers. And we use the spin diffusion barrier of about 1.8 nanometers. We're going to define this DNP polarization transfer coefficient, KDNP, from this polarization flux. And that's where this is. This is this flux of polarization across that spin diffusion barrier, which is just as a film resistance to, to, to polarization transfer. And that at the interface, which is this R spin diffusion barrier between the spin diffusion and the distant nuclei of the solid. So this is this this is the spin diffusion barrier. We're just gonna we're interested in what's happening. Whatever gets across, does what get across? How does that compare with what's being transported? And so this KDMP is just a proportionality constant that quantifies the rate of polarization transfer across this spin diffusion barrier. Just to quickly ask the the question that did come in there, Brad. Um, sure. You just clarify um, when you're talking about energy uh, in the context of NMR polarization, but what what form of energy that is? Well, you know, we can this 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 um, even in our case it that, that QH this as I show uh, right here this Q, this is the flux of uh, polarization flux across this interface this dotted line here. This polarization flux rho H CZ KDMP and this has these units of watts per meter squared per polarization. So it's it's an energy. I mean, in fact, we know we have an energy conserving flip-flops out here. The problem here is in this barrier A region, it's not energy conserving because of the inhomogeneous fields that Janak and Redfield had basically shown long, long ago. And so we're not doing anything that basically uh, is, uh, we're just taking those you know insights, but we're saying what we're applying is this polarization transfer coefficient such that this looks now to us like a very simple, familiar condition where in fluid mechanics or in catalyst um, mass transport or in thermal, uh, in more traditional uh, uh, heat transfer, you don't really know what's happening at the boundary between a fluid and a solid, or in this case here. And we just say, well, we're going to just do the best we can and we're going to treat this polarization transfer coefficient. And we have, but we do have to say that otherwise this is an adjustable parameter and we're going to show that we can do this based on measurements in order to obtain what it is, but it is just an energy. And, you know, as we know, when we put in a radio frequency pulse in, into our system, we're, in, we're, in, we're applying energy, you know, we make a, 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 a nuclear spin transition and, and it's a frequency response to a, you know, restoration to equilibrium during T1, for example. So it's really, an, I think energy is the best way to think of this. Okay, so it's really like the the Zeeman energy of the orientation of the spin and the magnetic. That's exactly energy. right. Yep, it's just Zeeman energy, and and that you know when you but you know we apply a pulse and we're putting energy into it, and then it you know it and then we in that case it's the spins precessing as they refer to thermal equilibrium, and so it's a spin temperature kind of effect. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so so again, this has this again relationship to these film what they call film coefficients, and these films are these 
basically what they describe these very thin uh, regions over which nobody really knows what's going on. You have a solid, let's say you have a Newton's law of cooling, which uh, Joseph Fourier, same guy who basically was the Fourier transform. Uh, brilliant, these are brilliant uh, French uh, mathematicians and physicists and physical chemists uh, back in the, uh, the 18th century and early 19th century, Jean-Baptiste Biot. And you know, they, can, they, they have these terms where they have the flux as a function of uh, R, R being the sum from, from some from center. And then you have a gradient uh, the bulk way out, in the, which in our case will be zero in the case of if we make it polarization. Then you have the, the temperature at this film boundary, and then you have this, this, this film resistance to, to heat transfer. And it's basically a hot solid and a cold fluid. And, and, and what it is, it's a small delta, very small region where you have this approximate linear profile. And hence, that linear profile, the gradient of the T here to the here basically is a portionality coefficient, and this is the heat transfer coefficient. That's what we're using, and that's analogous kind of to our KDNP. And uh, and so as I show here, we have now our flux, the function of R, flux of the pro of the polarization going across it. Now uh, again, this is an analogous to the Janak Redfield model, and you have now you have this polarization gradient across that from the cross effect that's you know kind of let's say six fifty eight to something out here that's less than that usually. And then you have these terms here, which, and then this is the equivalent rho H C Z K D M P. This is, that product is the equivalent to the heat transfer coefficient. So we know that rho H, that's, and you can adjust it with the density of the spins. You have the C Z, you're basically taken from your field strength and your, whatever nucleus you're looking at and so on. KDNP, and so we've almost got this if we can sort of find out what KDNP is, but we have this highly polarized core, let's say 658, the polarization and the bulk spin ensemble, and it's got to jump across the spin diffusion barrier, and then it's transited by dipole-dipole couplings into the blue region. So here's where we're now going to say, I, got, I think we get into some really, uh, I, think, I think it's exciting, and I think it's profound, and what we do is we are going to then normalize the various spatial and time variables with respect to characteristic times and, and spatial uh, um, distances. So we have this, this is the polarization variance that I had before. Uh, we have, and we're gonna normalize the, this, the time variable in this equation by the relaxation time. So we're gonna scale it by T1. T1 in the absence of any, um, any paramagnetic spin. And then we're going to basically do the R with respect to, and this is going to be with respect to the Wigner sites radius. There's a little, it's a little bit more complicated, but this is the, the R is the, the, the scaling of this. And I can refer you to the paper to go into that a little bit more detail, but we do that. And what, and I'll, I just want to keep moving so we can make sure we have a little bit further. We have, so we can finish in time for questions because uh, I see time is advancing. And that allows us to take this equation here and take these, this, this kind of dog's breakfast of different, parameters here and here, and basically take them and non-dimensionalize this equation into a relationship that looks much simpler. And so this non-dimensionalized polarization balance is familiar to chemical engineers, only it doesn't look exactly the same because it's just a different physical process. But we've got this polarization as a function of time, which it depends on time and, and, uh, and space in terms of dimensionalized variables. And we have everything else is out, has, long, has lost, but we, now we have this parameter phi. And this, for chemical engineers, is a very familiar one called the Thiele modulus. And this is a term that relates in chemical engineering mass transport to the rate of chemical reaction over the rate of diffusion. So it's a wee, way of, do, of, of assessing whether chemical reaction rates are dominating versus spin diffusion or, 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 or molecular diffusion dominating, so that you can see which of those are rate limiting. You have a very cold temperature and the chemical reaction rate is, is slow, you'll have a small Thiele modulus. In this case, we're doing something that allow has something very similar. We have, the, this allows us to identify the relative rates of polarization transfer by spin diffusion down here versus polarization dissipation by spin lattice relaxation. And this comes out just naturally from nothing more than those scaling uh, arguments that I mentioned, because you see here, the, the row H CZs cancel, and you're just left with these, these other terms, 
which then now appear up, up in here. So, so now when we look at this for the specific practical case, let's say amylpol and frozen glycerol water, which is DMP juice, we now have for seven for this two millimole amylpol and for DMP juice, we've got a density of 32 molar proton density. We take uh, R for the separation for the uh, from from that uh, basically it's the distance between radicals uh, of six nanometers. The spin diffusion coefficient from from the anal the the um, from Arthur Pinon's work, we measure the T1 separately. We calculate CZ. Everything is known, and we can calculate. We have a Thiele modulus that's small, four times ten to the minus two. And what that means is that that tells us because this is small, because it's much less than one, it tells us that the rate of proton spin diffusion is fast relative to the rate of proton spin lattice relaxation. That is. That is that the magnetization is being transferred fast compared to the way the way the spin spins are relaxing. That's good. We want the magnetization to propagate, and if we and and therefore, and if we look at this, this is basically close to zero. And so, if we take this and look at this in terms of like an enhancement of this on the blue out here, and do this as a function of varying rho h, it's a we are assuming that it's a propagating in three dimensions. So we scale this as the cube of the proton spin density of the solvent. We adjust that with the level of due duration. So you can go to from no due duration down here uh, to and where it's, uh, or excuse me, um, no uh, full due duration down here to high, high uh, out here. And then what you get is that you get this, these curves where the, you see that, uh, that this enhancement is, is very high. And hence what we conclude is that Glycerol water is a very good at retaining polarization. That's why we all use it because it does. What Bob and his crew, uh, team have done is they've developed this very, um, very uh, uh, excellent formulation, which is actually about the best it can be. And you can see, though, if you change these parameters by increasing, the, let's say, the level of of um, of uh, protons. Uh, 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 density in the uh, in the solvent, you'll see that this Thiele modulus will be reduced, uh, and and you can see that you'll end up reducing your enhancement. So we can essentially predict the the enhancement. And if you want to use a different glycer different level of deuteration, a different glycerol water or something else, uh, deuteration of the tetrachlorobenzene or dichloro uh, uh, dichlorobenzene or tetrachloroethane, you can do this in a similar way because all of these are well known. Uh, and, um, and and then we'll you can uh, you can easily figure that you know where you want to be. Now the other thing we're going to do so that's a mass transfer analogy, but in this case we have a, in heat transfer we have analogy to um, that to the uh, that is also helpful to us. So we can apply this Neumann boundary condition. We have this flux that I showed earlier. This is the heat. This is this uh, heat transfer coefficient term out here. And if we non-dimensionalize that, as I had indicated here, I can non I non-dimensionalize now the boundary conditions. So I non-dimensionalize this, and then these the rho h's and c's cancel, and we just got the these here, here. Now we non-dimensionalize those, and we get now for this boundary condition here, we get this polarization as a function of r, and then we've got this gradient here, which we accept, and now we have this other dimensionless parameter r k d m p over d h, and this has a uh, direct analogy to heat transfer called the BO number. And the BO number reflects the extent to which internal heat transfer limitations prevail versus the rate at which heat is being delivered from some medium out external to that body. So you have a spin diffusion resistance, if you will, internally to a spin exchange resistance, which is how fast you get it across that boundary. And in the analogy here, we talk about it in the paper is for this, uh, like a fin. If it's very thin, then you have, uh, you don't have to consider, you know, gradients within the, the fin itself. And, uh, and therefore you can just work, look, look at what's happening in terms of the heat transfer along the film. And it's a one dimensional problem. If you have a, uh, a kind of a stubby type fin, then you have to consider a two-dimensional heat transfer because there could be gradients in two dimensions within that fin. And then you have to, then it's a, a two-dimensional problem. And so, but the nice thing about this is that, uh, that you, can, you can quickly see whether the system is, is like the one on the right, called so-called thermally thin, and or thick, which is this one here. And they, because they have different BO numbers. 
And the limiting cases are for a very small BO number, much less than one, polarization then is distributed among these bulk proton nuclei within this sort of far from the, the radical much more rapidly than polarization is transferred across the barrier. In other words, in this case, the polarization across the barrier, the spin diffusion barrier, is rate limiting compared to the rate at which it's being whisked away by dipole-dipole couplings once it gets to the other side of that barrier. This is spin exchange limited. It's the rate at which polarization is transferred across the spin diffusion barrier is limiting the amount of polarization we get in the bulk. On the other hand, the other limiting case is if the BO number is much greater than one, then the polarization is transferred across the barrier much more rapidly. And then you just don't have enough proton nuclei to take it away. And so the polarization is spin diffusion limited as to how fast it gets out of the, away from the radical. And for that, we have, so we can calculate that. And so here's the BO number, the relative rates of polarization transfer across that spin diffusion barrier to a spin reservoir compared to spin diffusion within that reservoir. And for, the, for similar types of conditions that I mentioned earlier, we can calculate this R and KDMP, and I'll show that in a minute. DM, we have, it turns out to be about one times 10 to the minus two, which is much less than one. And this then tells us that right away that we're in a good regime where, at least a regime where that the rate of spin diffusion in this bulk fluid, uh, bulk frozen matrix uh, uh, far uh, from the, from the uh, spin diffusion barrier is much faster relative to the polarization that's crossing it. And that the rate limiting step therefore is not the spin diffusion away from that source, it's the polarization transfer from those hyperfine coupled nuclei to the bulk ensemble in the first place. So why do you, we care about this? Well, the reason why we care about this is because if we wanna get more polarization to the surface, we wanna know where the rate limiting processes are and that's where we should concentrate. So in other words, this tells us that, you know, we really are lucky to have people like Paul Tordeau and Olivier Uari back who are working with closely with Anne and, and Lyndon, Anne Lesage and Lyndon Embley to devise these, these biradicals such that, and the, and the right polarization transfer media in which this happened in order to optimize the rate of these polarization transfer from the, from the, the paramagnetic centers to the, the nuclei in the bulk because that is the rate limiting process to much of this. So I think that's a pretty helpful result that comes out of this without any adjustable parameters. So just to kind of pull this down to some sort of like where we're going and I'll sort of then stop. We've got this energy transfer. Think of this, so this really does look a bit like a copper sphere then. So, I, so you have a copper sphere which conduct and the copper conducts thermal energy really fast. It's a, it's a conductor. And so you have the VO number, which is the heat transfer coefficient over the thermal conductivity with R, that's this. And then you have these high thermal conductivities and high heat transfer coefficients. And, and that means, and that is very analogous to these polarization situation that we have, where we have now this spin diffusion barrier here. We have a film resistance to, that is diff complicated and not really easily known. That's like our spin diffusion barrier. But what by cap, with the BO number here, we have this, KDNP, which is now this polarization transfer coefficient, that's the flux across the barrier region, like the flux across the stagnant heat transfer film, uh, the spin diffusion coefficient here in the buck. And by having that small, we now have a case where we have, in the case, like we would for the copper, uh, we have this cross effect polarization. We get to this, uh, that we have the, um, the uh, this, uh, this level of polarization at, 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 at the, um, thermal boundary with the bulk fluid. And if it was less, if it was much less than one, then it's basically we can, the polarization profile is essentially flat. That is, it's very fast and it basically can be considered essentially uniform throughout a sizable distance from that paramagnetic center. Whereas if it was much greater than one, then we have a gradient polarization gradient within that bulk frozen medium that basically would have a you know, dissipation as you get further and further away. And that would look like a similarity solution that you could also calculate, but then it, you, need, you can do an, a calculation. So this rate limiting step is the polarization transfer across the spin diffusion barrier. We can see that just in the properties of the material and that the BO number is small for all the conditions that we sort of have been worrying about in our group. So 
And this then is interesting because it turns out if we compare it to what other people have done before us, this BO number less than one turns out to be typical of most DNP formulations that are used. That's good because we really want to take advantage of all the polarization that we have to get it to where we want it to go. We want it to be efficient. And so the formulations now have been generally such that the BO number for the ones that we've looked at mostly have been in this situation where it's much less than one. So this, for the chemical engineers who may be there, justifies the use of this lump parameter approximation, which means that it's very simple. We don't have to consider a gradient in the, uh, in the, uh, in the surrounding frozen matrix. And, this, uh, and then so basically this complicated spin diffusion barrier is really transformed into just a source term, which has something that looks like this. So we have this source term and that le this leads to an analytical expression um, for the buildup time of the, uh, this buildup time, which now from the solution has the buildup time at TDNP. We have the spin relaxation, which we can separately measure. We um, R we know, and so from this we can simply we can now solve we, by measuring T1 and then and measuring the TDNP. We can actually solve for KDNP. So we can have this build. We measure these buildup times for these different proton spin densities for let's say different circumstances: glycerol water without any sort of uh, paramagnetic centers up here. We have the buildup time as a function of proton density. Uh, this is the, the would be the buildup time when you have the, the amylopole, two millimoles of amylopole or 12 millimoles of amylopole. Notice that as you increase the as you in, in, um, increase the, the paramagnetic centers, you increase the uh, you shorten the, the buildup time. That kind of makes sense. But basically, the net polarization you're going to get is going to be less because of the paramagnetic centers. So. When we look at how this compares, I, we had a nice discussion with uh, with Fred Mentic Vigier um, at uh, the ACS, and we had had a nice, a good exchange. And he had, uh, and we had looked at some of his earlier work. And it turns out that with Fred and Shimon Vega and Gail de Pop's earlier work, and uh, that they published, they were using ab initio predictions, uh, which are based on kind of the the some of these um, these predictions based on uh, the calculations and had these buildup times as a function of bulk T1 and so on, and the enhancement as a function of the bulk T1. And what you see is their simulations are these crosses, and our analytical solution basically maps right on top of it. Uh, and then similarly for the enhancement. So there was very satisfying agreement with the ab initio predictions, and I think that's all you know, really satisfying. I think it basically shows that, that you know, we've kind of got it right. But what I think the analytical solution does is it gives us much more intuition about the parameters that we as experimentalists could choose to adjust depending upon the complexity or the circumstances of our own material compositions. And so I think uh, I feel really good. I didn't know what the comparison would turn out to, but when it showed out so nicely, it, it made it, um, it, it kind of validated that there's the, the, the both approaches are providing consistent results um, I, what I think the analytical solution provide again is intuition and some specific guidance of where the different parameters that we can adjust can be uh, having their effect. So uh, I'll kind of coming to a conclusion here. Uh, so what we have is this polarization transfer coefficient. Then we now measure T1, we measure TDNP, we know R. So we can for, we can for all these different terms we calculate our KDNP. And so plotting that KDNP, that polarization transfer co coefficient, as a function of that cubic of the density, we find that for very um, for low proton densities, that is for a lot of deuterons and not many protons, we find this they all all for the different two millimeter animal pole and 12, they all lie on a, basically a, a, a line. So there's a strong dependence of this polarization transfer coefficient on proton density. And that the larger the proton uh, that polarization transfer coefficient, the higher the rate of polarization transfer to the bulk. So that's good. You want so hence you don't want to have it fully deuterated. That makes sense. You want to have protons out here. So the more protons add, you can say you're you're getting more polarization out, and that's good. Now you might think one might think that well, let's just keep adding protons. Why don't we use a fully protonated uh, solvent? And the answer is because of this. As you continue to add protons, you have dipole-dipole couplings, and you can have relaxation effects from that, but also you end up now having a point where now the rate of polarization transfer is now declining 
uh, for re as I as though the rate of the polarization transfer um, coefficient is diminishing, and and it depends on the on the biradical concentration here. And so, what we have is we have these are the two regimes I was talking about. As you have this buildup here that's going up, you feel it's a volcano plot where you have this regime that is spin diffusion limited. That you're limited by how fast you can take polarization away from your source paramagnetic center. Out here, now it's coming, it, you're pulling away so fast that it's spin exchange limited. And the more radicals you have, the, the sort of the, then, then it basically can, you end up uh, having it depend on the paramagnetic centers. And so this spin diffusion limited regime in, that is increasing proton proton dipole couplings promotes more rapid transport across the barrier. It's basically sucking it across. across for uh, spin exchange limited, the transport is impeded by the spin diffusion barrier itself. Other people probably on this call may know more about that than me. Um, and the slow or slow cross effect exchange kinetics. And that's where maybe a new radical, uh, biradical design could, could be helpful for different conditions. And, and what's really nice is that this, what we see is that the point of this volcano is very close to what DNP juice actually is. So what I don't I don't can't say for sure how Bjorn and and um, Corzelius and Bob uh, uh, you know came to the theirs is about thirteen molar more or less but they they but this um, but this calculation with no adjustable parameters other than these and these everything is based on measurements or what we know shows that they've got to essentially the optimum for for the conditions for which the you know uh, the these other um, solution phase DMP and others are. Um, Dissolution DMP are used, but for solids, this is you know depending so much on what our materials and our that we're interested in will make a difference for all of them. Now I'm going to conclude by just bringing this. I mentioned about across uh, dissimilar solid interfaces. I think I've got just a couple slides left, and that's our that now once I was been focusing till now on this what getting it across this spin diffusion barrier, and this is the film for these biradicals. What I now want to do is we want to take that and transfer it to some sort of macroscopic surface that's far from these centers. And we and so we have now a frozen solvent. Each right? so of these little red dots corresponds to what I just talked about. But now they're going to be in an ensemble of a frozen solvent above a solid particle. And that solid particle could be a polystyrene sphere, or it could be a, um, a cement particle. It could be something else. Any, any or a semiconductor particle. Uh, Lyndon and Arthur have used it for indium phosphide and such. And now we can just break this down into three regimes. We have the frozen particle that I just talked about. We have the, uh, the frozen solvent. We have the solid particle sink here. And now we have this sort of interface across this bare boundary between them. And so we just now have three couple differential equations. We have the medium uh, DNP solvent. We have the interface and we have the solid particle. There's a Thiele modulus for each of those. There's a polarization for each of those. There's an enhancement for each of those. And, and so we, it's basically analogous to heat conduction across a composite wall where you have a series of thermal resistance where the polarization that originates out here in this part in this paramagnetic center has to be transferred. All of them, they get to the particle surface and then they transfer it to the particle sink. Now, Joachim Klaus and, and, Klaus and um, Hans Spies back in the, in, in the 1990s did this for, for polymers and they have this and we're going to take some of these boundary conditions where we did this for looking at how uh, interfacial boundary conditions and, and polymers. So you have this interface across the polymer and you have the flux across them. They have to be continuous. And when we do that, what we find is that we use these same sort of forms for the non-dimensional analysis. We get a Thiele modulus for each of these different regimes. And when we do that, what we find is that, uh, first of all, here's the glycerol water data that I show. I'm just looking at the salt. Huh? And when we put in the polystyrene sphere, what we what we found, and others have too, is that just by putting the polystyrene in, you diminish by a lot the enhancement that you get in the glycerol water frozen solvent. So remember, we were up here without any polystyrene spheres. When we put the polystyrene in, it basically drops the enhancement by about an order, by at least an order of magnitude. And, and that and is something we can, so we have now, so this is the, we have a Thiele modulus of our solid, and that basically is, you can think of it like this. We've got this polarization partially deuterated, and now we have this polystyrene, which is just full of protons. We're not partially deuterating it. And this part, this now fully protonated is basically 
has a lot of high, very high uh, heat capacity, if you will, energy capacity, spin capacity to absorb the, the limited energy that's coming from here. So we get high enhancements, but there's so much sort of a sink here that it just sucks the polarization up and it basically affects the enhancement also of the, of the, of the liquid, of the frozen glycerol water. And when we look, and then we look at the solid itself, that for the polystyrene conditions, we have now a thelium modulus of about two. So for this, we never get very high polarizations. They're always around somehow, well, they're better than nothing, but basically it's, it's way down here. So this thelium modulus can be used to predict the polarization enhancements, enhancements of both the solvent and the, and, and the target material and, and do though in a way which is just uh, very, again, based on the uh, coupling across them to understand quantitatively how and why they have the enhancements that they see. So I've gone a little bit longer than I anticipated, but, uh, but I just wanna say these are the, 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 uh, the, the, the conclusions. Uh, you can read more about it in this paper, which again, it was a couple of years ago, but I think it describes it. I think it's, um, I think it's a very useful one. And I think it's these non-dimensional scaling analyses, I think are the part of the, that apply to the source term that now is present compared to earlier work, but the quantitative insights on these rate limiting processes hopefully will be helpful to others with material science applications for DNP. I think it's applicable to other nuclei for sure, other conditions as I've tried to indicate. And I think they would also be useful for maybe even optical polarization processes where there's a barrier to transfer it to the desired target material. So I'll, I'll thank my coworkers, especially Nathan, Arthur, and Lyndon, and happy to stay on longer if necessary, or if people would like to take any questions. Okay, hey, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, walking us through a really detailed way to look at these uh, DMP processes. So uh, encourage everyone to ask questions in the Q and A. Uh, we've already had a few coming in. So first question is from uh, Eddie Dib, who uh, thanks for the great talk, um, and asks whether we can uh, enhance the the transfer of polarization from um, from the, the radical out to the solution if we saturate the uh, the, the the solution. Saturate now, I guess he means with, uh, well, saturate it with what? I'd be my saying, because polarization is what we're trying to get out to it. So it wouldn't have a, wouldn't be, but sat I guess the, my, my follow up is I'm not sure what we're saturating it with. If we saturate. I think the idea is that uh, you, you'd be, well, say, so if you imagine that the core is has, uh, a low spin temperature and the, the solution has a high spin temperature, um, if you, yeah, saturate it with RF pulses, you make it hotter. Um, obviously, that's not helpful in actually getting polarization, but the transfer of polarization oh, would be enhanced. I, yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, so I, uh, to the extent that, I, you know, I'm trying to think of why you would want to do that, because, but I guess if you, if you, so if, if in their case, you'd have, you start off your, your bulk polarization, we assume would be zero, is zero, our bulk and okay. our bulk. So we assume that it's zero. I mean, there's a thermal polarization, of course, in the magnetic magnet. But we as, we assume it's zero. If it's not zero, then it would be some, you know, finite uh, above that. That would um, that would basically give you the equivalent, I guess. Of uh, I have to go back and look at the calculation, but basically it would just uh, mean that you would not take it to zero. And um, the, but the boundary conditions should still apply. So I guess the treatment should still be calculable. So I haven't thought about that, but I, I think that. Uh, the, under the most conditions, the polarization generated by the microwaves to the electron and so on are going to be much much larger than that of which is going to be in the in the, the thermal bulk. But that maybe there's some interesting physics that could look at what happens the other direction if you do that. That would sound like it's similar to what Janak and Redfield did with looking at it as a sink going the other direction. So yeah. I think there's the there's a something to be said that as you get close to the to, to the suit, the limiting case that I spoke about and what they did, then you, you could might get some interesting back and forth that would happen. Yeah, I think the physics would definitely work. It may not, if you're actually trying to boost the sensitivity, not, not quite what you want. But. Okay, uh, second question was from um, Fred Perra, uh, who says, uh, hi Brad, beautiful work. Uh, he's, he loves that you can measure KDMP experimentally. Um, and so uh, he's shown that um, KDMP can be calculated using ab initio methods. Um, so not from the experimental buildup time on the enhancement. Um, have you thought about comparing your experimental values with Fred's theory? Oh, well, I think that's, uh, I think that maybe that's what I was talking about. In the ACS meeting, we spoke about that and, and, and it, it works well. 
So, so I think that uh, I'd have to go back and look at our correspondence, which was from a few months ago, but uh, we went back and, and looked at that. And I think that that uh, uh, my, I'll have to go back and look at a little bit more. Yeah, we haven't, we didn't follow very much that through on that, but that's a good suggestion. But the, that, um, th that seem our, everything looks like it's consistent with what he's doing uh, from his vantage point and also what, what we've shown. Um, okay. Great. And maybe if Fred, Fred's on, maybe he wants to weigh in on that. I don't know if, uh, or if, uh, but otherwise, uh, maybe I can talk to you a little bit more about that if you want uh, uh, after uh, after after we uh, after we finish. Well, uh, yeah, if there's further, further discussion, that would be um, good to have live. Um, Fred, do feel free to raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, um, also uh, just a comment for the excellent presentation, which is very nice from Marianne uh, Javoku. Um, I had a, a question um, that I, I had. So um, something that has been talked a little bit about um, in the community is um, using pulsed conditions, um, either sort of fast pulsing or even just you know on a slow time scale, you pulse the microwave on um, and then uh, turn it off. And so you're, you're trying to get the trade off between um, enhancement and also sample heating. Is that something that you'd be able to look at and, and optimize with your um, yeah, so, so that's that's really interesting. Yeah, you can always make these things more complicated. <laughs> so, so that, that thanks for that because uh, there there may be you know if, if you by, but in that case you would you would pulse it on and you know you basically would then then there would be a, an evolution and then you'd stop and then that gets then would be it's kind of like the first question there would now be some now there would be a polarization gradient or at least some polarization in the medium that would be non-zero. Mm -hmm. And and then while that that's relaxing, and so there would be some sort of adjustment, and then depending on how long you wait between pulses, and then and then if you pulse again, then so this is what you're talking about, Marion. I guess is a uh, is a not a continuous excitation, which this presumes. So in that case, the d that that q dot d and b that's the source term. That would be there would be on and off, and and things would be evolving during the. So maybe you could do an average Hamiltonian like approach where you get some average average aspects of this, but I think that uh, I, I don't see any reason why one couldn't just sort of, as we've done with the dissimilar materials, sort of in, interrupt it in, you know, as long as there's a, you start off with one and then you go to some uh, time and then stop it. And then that becomes the new boundary condition for the spatial and time components. And then you do it again. So I think this actually could lend itself to some predictive help for um, for wh what the effects would be. So I, I see that that would be probably something that could be pretty easily incorporated, maybe more and then in a way which would then make the on and off comparisons that you're looking at and how things affect um, less ad hoc. So I guess this, I, don't, I see no, nothing complicated about adding you know, different time windows where you would look at how things evolve and then take those as the new boundary in time, initial conditions for your next stage. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so I have one last question. I mean, if anyone else has any questions, do last chance to put them in the Q and A. Um, so the final thing is based on kind of all of this extensive analysis. Um, at the end of the day, if we want to, I don't know, uh, enhance polystyrene better, is the example you, you get uh, gave. So the actual um, you know, sample of interest. What what do we need to do? Uh, what what are we aiming for um, to make it better? Yeah, that's a so so in that case, I think what we would do is. We'd go back. We'd want to, you know, this. So the um, spin diffusion coefficient T one. So we have. We'd like to get for the polystyrene. Let's say down here. This is the one on the left. Mm -hmm. You'd like to get adjust the conditions of the Tele modulus so that the that this would be basically moving up and up high, closer to to sort of what you would say up to closer towards zero or at least a smaller value. Uh, and that would be, you know, this. So how would we do that? Well, the spin diffusion coefficient itself is uh, hard to adjust, especially unless you're you're not going to probably not likely to go to an effort to partially deuterating it. But that could be happen. Could be, but the T one you could. So maybe there's ways. If you if you want to get this um, shorter, then maybe you look like you could uh, by somehow um, in um, increasing T one, for example. And uh, and therefore, if one increases T one, then uh, the, so there might be a benefit to perhaps uh, uh, having um, a uh, and adjusting it uh, in a way which would give uh, maybe by, also by temperature. 
Uh, temperature is another way to, to, to do this, perhaps without having to incorporate other things. So there may be a benefit to this, to going down to, I don't know, liquid helium temperatures and so on. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't expect the spin diffusion coefficient to change because it's just density dependent. It's energy conserving anyway. So I guess temperature would be the way I'd go uh, with that. And, uh, and that, you know, end up, uh, but then you could see how low and whether it's reasonable. The other thing that is often done, it may, and I, we haven't done very much in this our, ourselves, it may be worth looking at what we can do to kind of reduce this characteristic dimension R. In, ca in catalysis and in, th and these, and in um, heat transfer, R is this radius of that sort of bulk um, sample. So it, it, by making it smaller, you end up doing the same thing. So smaller particles ought to have that same effect in a way. So at least for the purpose of expanding, because then, then you end up uh, having uh, or, or making larger, you, you can use these are the these are the only three handles you can really do to to get this up up by this. It's this R, D, H, and T, T one, and probably the relaxation time and the R are the two places to look. Okay, cool. And that's that's nice that some of that is uh, is kind of intuitively what we've what we've been trying to do as well in terms of the, the T one with diffusion. So we we've had a few more questions come in uh, during that. So another question from Sam is. Uh, did you study how to optimize the polarizing power, so the electron concentration and the, the proton concentration um, of the DFP juice, um, depending on the proton concentration of the um, the, the crystal or, or whatever your um, your solid is? You know, we did not, and I don't know that that would pay off in a very very large way. Mainly because you know we we're already at, you know kind of the the you know, the, the glycerol water is doing its job and it's basically, you can think, I think the way I think of it is like this, is that you've got this glycerol water and you, or you have some polarization. Now that looks like it's about as optimum as it can be. You can't get it really much better than what we've, what, you know, Bob's formulation and team was. But now what we're doing, we're putting in something that's uh, had got this sort of polarization or temperature. Now we're putting in a polystyrene, which is basically cold or, or at least uh, had no polarization. And so therefore, it's basically a big sink, and so it just you know pulls the polarization down. So I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't expect my intuition that I don't expect that that um, that there's much to be gained from focusing more on this. I think it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, or, but it, w it would be different for different. I mean, polystyrene has a lot of protons. Other things uh, or other nuclei like semiconductor particles. If you want to polarize phosphorus. Or something they'll have it, and they'll have a spin diffusion coefficient, of course, between phosphorus and phosphorus, as opposed, or or let's say some other, or if there's a you know quadrupolar nuclei, they will be you know reducing the perhaps the the um, uh, the uh, rate of propagation because the T ones may be higher. So I think I, I just don't think that uh, trying to in, optimize or increase this is going to do much better than what you've got now. It's really the target that's causing the the uh, it was the, is where I would put the focus on optimizing, you know, how to get the polarization that you do have into the target that you want in a way which gives you the, you know, the optimum signal. So I don't think that, yeah, I think that's my, would be how I would approach it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Kendra Frederick, who asked whether you've looked at different radicals. Um, so you mentioned that experimentally, um, something like totopol is very sensitive to per deuteration, whereas something like asympol poc is less sensitive. Um, and is that something that comes into your um, BO number? So that, I think, uh, the, where that comes in is, is really in, the, um, in, in getting it across this. So th this it really is where, again, it, where I would focus, as you suggest, uh, the hyperfine coupled nuclei to these bulk resemblance spin ensembles, you know, the higher we can make this, this uh, polarization here at the spin diffusion barrier, and that involves two things. It involves the radical that's generating it, and then whatever it is around that, those limitations, which are these, you know, these, these what is it, these quenched regions. I'm sorry, I, I was headed up there. Oh, there it is, uh, where you have, I'm oh, sorry, um, that basically it's these, rate limiting processes that that this is where I would focus. So, you know, in terms of getting more polarization that we can then use, th that's exactly where I would I would do more. We've not we've not explored that. We've not explored that. And I think there's I guess there's my I would say great encouragement for this being a very fruitful 
avenue to pursue uh, to understand the conditions which would give more polarization at that barrier. Uh, and that could be temperature, could be radical, could be solvent formulation. Okay, so one last question from Asif, um, who asks how you consider the effect of local um, versus global proton concentration. So I guess uh, if the proton concentration isn't homogeneous like you assume. Oh, wow. I, you know what? That again, <laughs> you, again, you can only make it more complicated, but I think then what you would have is you'd have your, uh, your row H would be a function of R. Mm -hmm. And you would have to that, you, but again, I think this is a mean you could you could just then it, I wouldn't that what that would mean is you wouldn't have an analytical solution, but you could but you could numerical, and so uh, and and in fact what we found is that and then this, and I'll point this out because I I didn't take time to do that but if we the other thing is here and this is related to us if is that you you see here is we've got this nice parameters here and it follows really nicely at high proton concentrations. And down a low one, it looks like it, it. These data points fall pretty far off this this T Lee modulus, and for the and and that actually is uh, we've this red curve actually is where we've taken into account a non-uniform distribution of radicals. That is, in this case, <clears throat> as you get to low proton concentrations, but this these points down here show you have more polarization enhancement than you did, and if if you just had uh, if you in your if your proton in your solvent was was getting sufficiently low, and this. Is where you have direct um, hyperfine interactions from the radical to into the into the polystyrene. So, so in other words, you have in this case a combination of things that are far from it and spin diffusion to it. So it's spin diffusion transfer to the polystyrene, and then you have these which are near the surface, which are directly polarizing it uh, when you have insufficient proton density. So I think there's um, just ways to incorporate that if one just inserts it just it wouldn't lead to an analytical solution okay yeah you can always make it more complicated but, but uh, I, think the formulation can adjust, can accommodate it but then you just have to do it numerically <laughs>